and fellowship to the breaking of bread um, and to the prayers. Amen. Amen. And so every time we come to church, we must remember these five purposes for coming to church. Maybe sometimes these things are inclusive because church becomes something that you go to on Sunday. But you come to church to be able to sing unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, let us sing together unto the Lord. Corporately, something happens when we sing together unto the Lord. Amen. When we sing together with our voices unto the Lord. It's a reason for us to gather together, to sing together unto the Lord. Instruments help us as we sing with our voices unto the Lord. So it's important how 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 Samaya and you are you are coming from home and you are putting your mindset. Remind yourself, I'm going to sing unto the Lord. Amen. I'm coming to sing. I'm having a mindset that I'm going to sing together with the saints. Another purpose why we come together is for fellowship. Amen. It says that they, they were fellowshipping together. And so it's not just about coming and going. Um, they came and they fellowship with other Christians. And the way that fellowship works in the Bible is... Uh, the Bible says we should sing together with psalms, hymns, and spiritual. We should talk to each other with some hymns and spiritual songs. So the way that you are fellowshipping, you are encouraging someone else, you are strengthening someone else, you are spending time encouraging each other in the Lord. Amen. That's what happens when we come together. But you not only come together for fellowship, but we come together to listen to the Word of God. Amen. A very important discipline. We come together to listen corporately to the Word. Brother, come and get a message on why it's important for us to come to church and listen to someone preach to us. Amen. Because that's the, the Bible says they spend time listening to the apostles teaching. Amen. That's the discipline that they give themselves. But not only that, we come together to pray. Hallelujah. So when you are coming through that door, put it in your mind that I'm coming to pray. Amen. I'm coming to pray. We are coming together to pray. And lastly, we come together to give. Hallelujah. Amen. To give unto. Those are the five purposes of worship. So what Jeff always says is, check to see if, am I fulfilling all those five purposes of worship that we are coming to church? So we say these things because I think sometimes we take for granted what church is about. We think Kumuti is just about coming and being a spectator and sitting down and, and just listening. But no, no. It's actually we are participating. We, it's all about us as the congregation here uh, and, and what God has said that we must do. Amen. Amen. I just want to remind us of that, that we, we can really always remember when we, when we come to church. Let's have that mindset every Sunday. We're going to sing one song, Hakili um, J, and then we are going to be hearing from the word of the Lord. Hakili J. Kill him song that says, I'm coming back to the heart of worship, where it's all about you. It's all about you. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it, where it's all about you. That's what the songwriter says. I pray that as we, as we seek to do that, that the Lord will meet us, and even when we have instruments coming back and singing, that we'll understand what it's truly about. Amen. That it's all about God. Amen. It's all about Him, and we are here to worship and praise Him. Amen. 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 Are we ready to hear the word? Yes. Amen. And the call for the government to come and give us the word for this morning. Amen. 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 Is it fine?
Okay, let's close our eyes and pray. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your goodness and your love, Lord in heaven. We thank you, Father, for your kindness, Lord, and, uh, and the blessing to which you have given to us, Father. That we can come together, Lord in heaven, as prophets and Christians, Father. As sons and daughters, Lord in heaven, that we have been brought, Father, to this inheritance, Lord. We thank you, Father, Lord in heaven, for this wonderful church. We thank you, Father, Lord in heaven, for the way in which you've blessed us to come together. We ask, Lord in heaven, by your might and your grace, that you may please be with us today, Father. That what I speak, Father, may please come from you. That I may not fail you and cause any sins upon my life. That I may not say incorrect things, Father, to your people. That I may be led by your Holy Spirit, please, Father. I pray for the congregation, Father, that your people, Lord in heaven, may hear the words that you speak and not hear anything else, Father. That they may be attentive to you and to you alone, but that they may be attentive, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and I thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, good morning, church. Good morning. 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 Kaza mara gaza yana mosto ba tama nito mara de kraka ba ba nomo radio ya fansi ni ana kraka tama gani na ina mara tana gatu those types of things so we are blessed to have everyone here present um kena kamu brother kamu and uh, I just want to thank our senior pastor Funis Fusiso for allowing me the chance to come and speak today we are still in our series of Ephesians and um, if you have your Bibles here with you please open up to the book of Ephesians. Um, Open with me. Let's do a very, very, very quick recap of what the book of Ephesians is telling us. Remember, we started the series in Easter at Ephesians chapter 1, um, where during the Easter series, the great pastors went through from verse 1 all the way up to verse 14. And in this book of Ephesians, from those verses, we learned about different things that the Lord has for us. But the first thing that Paul does for us in this in this book of Ephesians, in this amazing book, as he introduces it, he tells us that the Lord has blessed us. Yes. He tells us that we are blessed in verse 3. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. Then he starts to mention various blessings that have been granted to us. He even tells us about the time at which he began to bless us. Before the world was even created, the Lord decided to start blessing us. You, as you sit here today, have been blessed by the Lord. For the mere fact that you are here today saying that you are a Christian already means that there are multitudes of blessings and powers that have been directed towards you before the planet was even formed. Not before you were born, before the planet was born, before the oceans were laid, before the land had grown, the Lord had already began blessing you in your life today. This is the word of the Lord that he tells us in Ephesians 1. So this is what they were telling you. And then he goes on then after that. He says his first prayer in the, in the scriptures from verse 16. He says, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love towards all of the saints. And Funisa today was telling us about one of the purposes of being here together, fellowshipping together. There's a significance in Christianity, not only about love, but about loving each other within the church. So already today, we need to begin to think about whether or not we love each other. I'm not asking you if you love the Lord. I'm asking you if you love your brother, the brother next to you, if you love your sister. If you consider it of the church as a body, if you consider it of the members of the church and the work in which is being done here, it is a great work. This work started before the foundation of the planet. The Lord had a mystery that he had put aside, and that mystery gets unfolded within this body. And in the body, next to you, are all the individual members. And together we are the body of Christ. And do we love each other? So that's the first thing that Paul knows to us in this prayer. So then he goes, and as he prays, of course, because God is so good and gracious to us, he starts telling us about other things in which we have been given. Inheritance, riches of glorious inheritance. And he tells us about... Uh, 
lost my place, immeasurable greatness of his power toward you. He begins to speak about these various things that have been directed towards us. So today, Vazolan, if you're not feeling blessed, I'd like to remind you of Ephesians chapter 1. If you were there for the sessions that were spoken about from verse 1 to verse 14, from verse 15 to verse 22, 23, remember that you are blessed today. Remember that you have an inheritance in the Lord today. Remember that there is power directed towards you today. Remember that you were once dead in trespasses, but the Lord took you out of that sin and brought you today to be a Christian. That was chapter 2, as Pastor Spoo took it. Pastor Spoo took us and this chapter 2 where, where Paul reminds us, guys, you were at first not even acknowledged by the Lord as a child. You were a mere creation. You were a man that was made, not his child. But today, as you sit here, because the Lord has awoken you and has blessed you, you can now go to him boldly, confessing Christ and saying to him, Abba, Father, God, you are my Father. This is because of the graciousness that God has towards us in our life, that even when we didn't want him, he wanted us, and he went to seek us, and he got us. Amen. 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 And so then he moves on to remind us, says, guys, you were like this, but now you are no longer like that. And last week, our guest pastor came through and he spoke to us about this mystery that was there. This mystery wasn't first explained to us in, cha in chapter 3. Remember, Paul touches on it just vaguely in Ephesians 1 when he says, uh, He says, I lost my place. Excuse me, someone. This mystery is introduced in Ephesians 1 verse 8. Uh, one, chapter 1, in which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, made, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to the purpose which he set forth in Christ. So there is a mystery of God's will. There's something that the Lord hasn't told, not only us, but the whole planet. The Lord has been quiet for a very, very long time. From when he had created the entire universe, Thousands and thousands of years ago, when he spoke the earth and the world into being, when the angels were there, he, there was something that he was quiet about when he was there engaging with Abraham and saying to him that your sons will be as numerable as the stars of the heavens and the sands of the sea. He didn't just mean a certain group. He was quiet about something. And this mystery is now revealed in chapter 3, verse 6. This mystery is that Gentiles, us, non-Jews, people who are not Jewish, the Gentiles are fellow is members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Paul says from verse 4, when you read things, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles, us, Fellow is and members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. If we are sitting here today and we are not impacted in our lives by Christianity, if you sit here today and let's say maybe you've been a confessing Christian for the past 2, 3, 4, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years and you examine your life and you perhaps even think, and you can't see a difference. You have not taken the time to engage with this mystery. Mm. The moment we begin to understand that we are Christians, or Christianity is not just something you come to on a Sunday, get like wrecking, I sit down, you know, my life doesn't change. There's a problem. There is a fundamental power that has to do with the person. There's something significant in your heart. There is change. There is change because you believe in the things that you are told. And very quickly you realize what of the Bible is filled with promises. Filled with a different life. I mean, he just told us. He started off with promises and blessings. He started off, in, uh, even if you look at Peter, when Peter starts chapter 2, um, 2 Peter chapter 1, when he says, in 2 Peter chapter 1, he says that he has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He has given us all things. 
So it's a big deal to these apostles where they say you can enter his presence with confidence. Whose presence? The presence of the owner of the universe. You know, it's like imagine being able to go to the most powerful person in your country to ask him for a favor. But now you don't get one favor, you get as many favors as you want. So you go to the guy, can I have a wish? What's your wish? I want a million wishes. Here's a million wishes. You start to go through all of your wishes. You are able to request upon the creator, the all-powerful one. Which is, in Ephesians 1, Paul takes the time to explain to you the strength, the power, the work that the Lord has directed towards you to show you. Well, this is not a small thing. It's not a game, this thing of Christianity. To be transformed is not uh, something which is distant for us. It's a state of being to believe that God says he is who he is. It's a powerful thing to believe in the words you read in this book. It's also a powerful thing to abide by the words in this book. That is true Christianity. Christianity is not for us just to say, okay, yes, I'm a Christian. Why are you a Christian? No, I inherited it from my father by blood, so I'm a Christian now, and my children after me will be Christians. Okay, no. Do you read the scriptures? Yes, of course, we know the Bible. But do you read it? Do you engage with it? Do you believe in it? Do you believe it when they say that you're blessed? Do you believe it when they say that it's a mystery that you can now be a Christian? It's a free gift to you, but it didn't come for free. It came at a cost. And so then Paul then speaks about the fact that he says, this thing, this mystery, Paul himself, he says, of this mystery, of this gospel, verse 7, I was made a minister according to the gifts of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I'm the very least of all the saints this grace has given, what is this thing that Paul says that was given to him? Remember, this thing that was given to him is a thing that he went to jail for, and it's a thing that he died for. It's the thing that Peter died for. This thing that he's about to tell us, this thing that he has, that he has been given, that he's so blessed to have, that him being the least of all the saints was granted this thing, and this is the thing that kept him in prison, was what? The fact that he was allowed to do what? Bring light for everyone with the plan of the mystery of the hidden, that was hidden for ages in God. He says... Of this gospel I was made minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I'm the least of all the saints, the grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul says, this great gift was given to me. What gift? The ability to preach to all of you what the Lord has done, to tell you what he has done, so you can have it and own it. So that the church... In manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities of the heavenly places. This I want to address it right now. So, he says that this gift that has been granted, remember he's in prison, hey? You can see that because in verse 13 he says, I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you. He's suffering. Verse 1, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. It's not a metaphor. He was in jail for being a professing Christian. It's not a metaphor. Paul was stoned. Stones were thrown at him. For what? Confessing the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a metaphor. This is what he was experiencing at the time, and he took it as an honor to live and to die for the Lord, just so that he can confess this powerful mystery. And so he says, for this reason, verse 14, I bow my knees before the Father. He's praying now. Remember we had addressed initially in chapter 1, Paul had a prayer. There was a time when Paul prayed, and now Paul is praying a second time, right? Okay, so for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength, to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Okay, so let us attempt to tackle these verses. Very, very short amount of verses from verse 14 to verse 20. We're going to unpack Paul's very short but significant prayer today, and I'm hoping that in this process we are able to understand something very important. Number one is that Christianity is a religion of intentionality. 
goes on right now. We must be serious about being a Christian. It's not just a thing we say. If you're a Christian, it means you believe this book. It means you walk in the things of the Lord. You abide by the book. You're working hard to engage the Lord continually. We mustn't just be Christians. It's a far off thing. It must be our daily bread, Christianity. It's our lives. When we're in trouble, we pray to the Lord. Why is that? Because the Lord tells us, call upon me in your day of trouble and I will deliver you, you will glorify me. So because of that, when I'm in trouble, I pray to the Lord. I don't hold on to other things. I hold on to the Lord, right? And then when we are relieved from trouble and are released from trouble, we don't say, no, you say, it is the Lord who did this for me, right? You don't, you, don't, you don't get into distress, ask for help, and then when help is given, pat yourself on the back, but, ah, I'm not going to it's not practical. <laughs> it doesn't work. And for us, it's very, very easy for us to do that. It's very easy for us. And I'm not even talking about, you know, big, different types of troubles. Give like any form of trouble that we are in. The Lord doesn't specify. He just says, call upon me in your day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. The Lord wants your glory. He wants you to be able to understand that he's the one that redeems you that saves you, that helps you. That's important to the Lord. You can't, as a Christian, when we look at how accomplished you are, or how empowered you are, at Amarayas, because I got much earlier, I never had a lot of money, so what do you feel? What do you feel? feel like a man. Was it not the Lord who gave you these blessings? This is our Christianity. So Paul now is praying. Okay? So let's unpack Paul's prayer. Let's start at the beginning. Paul has a few very significant things that he says in the prayer. So the first one, he says that, look at it. Paul says that, that verse 16, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power. Right? Through his spirit. So that, verse, that, verse 17, so he's asking that, He's praying that the Lord may give you strength. He may give you power. First thing, so what? That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That's the first thing. According to Paul, the reason that those of you who confess relationship with God and say, I'm a Christian and the Lord Jesus Christ dwells in my heart, the reason is not because you yourself saw it. It's because the Lord gave you power to receive him. Okay? Ephesians chapter 2. Start at, let's start at verse 4. Verse 4, he says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespass, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. And then he says what? For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. No one may ever stand in front of God and say, I chose to come to you. I saw how important and amazing you were. I took the decision to be a Christian and I went and I made myself holy. Here I stand. It's not going to work like that. It is all the work of the Lord from the beginning to the end. So that even the work of him bringing Christ into our hearts requires the Lord himself to empower us. We need strength from God. If today... You might feel as if though, it happens to me all the time, I feel it right now, that, you know, this, 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 uh, this one great man, he said, he said this quote, he says that, um, if you're ever taken up with any enjoyment of this world that takes away your love for reading your Bible or for prayer, then you're abusing this world. The, the, the fact that you can be taken up with stress, uh, merego, ambition, you know, as young people, you know, you, you come there, you're like, hey, when you mama working at GTI, I didn't have a clear record, and I'm always banky, or now try work hard and do these different things, but you're so caught up in all these different things that could happen in the world that you begin to move away from just simplicity of praying and reading your Bible, you're abusing the world. And sometimes, it's very, very hard for you to reconcile yourself to the Bible. 
So even if you don't understand, if it is God himself who brings Christ into my heart, also perhaps the Lord himself can help me and reveal to me his significance. Not so. So my, my, my request is that if any of you have been feeling as if though you are trying, sometimes you say to yourself, no man, I need to get closer to the Lord. Mara, you get caught up by other things that you can't. Maybe you wake up in the morning at 6 to go to work. Now you're trying to wake up at 5 so you can read your Bible for an hour. Mara, you're in the if you snooze until quarter to six, now it's too late. You're unable to get yourself to do the things of the Lord. Ask the Lord for help. Because it is the Lord himself who brought Christ to you. So perhaps the Lord will reveal to you Christ's significance in your life. So let us continue to ask the Lord for help. But let us also understand the first thing about this prayer. Paul is praying that the Lord may come into your hearts. It's very interesting that he says this prayer like this. Because remember, in the prayer of chapter 1, verse 15, he says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. But now in chapter 3, he says that, I'm praying that the, that the Lord may give you strength, that Jesus may dwell in your hearts. <laughs> that you may have the faith that I think you have. Paul still prays for their faith, although he believes that they have it. You should also pray for your own faith. We will pray for your faith, even though we believe you have faith. We will pray for your relationship with the Lord, even though we believe you have one. Because prayer is the way in which we acknowledge the fact that we cannot do anything and ask the Lord for assistance. So we must pray for assistance. How do I know that I'll be a Christian tomorrow? I must pray and ask the Lord to continue to save me. He prays for that. Notice something very important. It takes power to do things. It takes power to have the Lord Jesus Christ come into our hearts. Paul asks that they may be empowered, right? So, if you look immediately after that, okay, so remember we are in chapter 3, we've just addressed that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, verse 17, look at the second one now, so this is point number 2, that you, Lena, being rooted and grounded in love, may have, again, power, strength, to understand, to comprehend. Let's stop there. Strength to comprehend. This takes me back to the first prayer that Paul made. Where in the first prayer, he prayed something very, very similar in that. You don't have to go there, I'll read it out for you. In the first prayer, he says that, that the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Having your eyes enlightened that you may know. We spoke about this thing of understanding in the Bible. About understanding Christianity. The things of the Lord, it's not just understanding up here. I understand up here. But to understand genuine God-fearing understanding is an understanding of truth. It's in your emotions. It's in your feelings. It's in your actions. It's in your task to truly understand something. I used a similar analogy last time. If I truly understand that if I jump off a building, I'm going to die, it would not make sense then for me to then say, ah, oh, I'm Superman, it's not gonna work. It's not going to work because I understand the implications of my decision. If you really understood, say for example now, the students that I hear, all our students from Saturday school, if you understood that if you work really hard and get 75%, you will go to the university that you want and you want to go to that university, you shouldn't be getting a 60 because you understand that if you work to truly understand something means you see it so clearly that even your actions reflect it, your emotions reflect it, your state of mind reflects it. It's more significant than Gatseva. No, 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 no. We know you don't know because we can see what you're doing. So even with Christianity, if you say, I understand it, we will know. The understanding that Paul is praying for is not just a mental comprehension of saying one plus one is two. It is a deep comprehension that reflects in all the things that you do. Right? So when he says then that, that you being rooted and grounded in love, it's deep. It's, the understanding is deep. You may have the, st the strength to comprehend with all of the saints. We'll address that. What is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge? Paul is praying 
that they may have knowledge of the love of Christ. That's the second thing. The second thing that Paul is praying for is that we may have knowledge. But this knowledge is not a simple knowledge. It is a knowledge of love. And he doesn't even ask you to love. He says, can you comprehend this love with the other saints? Do you and your brothers relate with this love? Do you relate this love to your brother? Do you relate this love to your sister? What was, what was the commandment that the Lord said in, uh, I think, uh, John 13? This is how you, they will know you are my disciples. By the way you... By the way you love one another. By the way you love one another. As saints that you may comprehend together this love of Christ. It begins here. Huh? It begins here with us. So the, 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 the first question that I'd like to ask us, not the first question, I've asked many questions, but the question I'd like to ask us, if we can just think about it, is, And with the church generally, do we have this love for each other? And how do we... Do, do we have this intentionality about loving each other? Are we considerate of each other? Are we kind towards one another? Do we, do we think of each other? Do we help each other in times of need? Yeah? You help someone. And the one who's being helped, do you abuse the help? <laughs> or do you receive the help as you should or no more? <laughs> so... This is something that Paul is asking of us, and it's very significant. Why is it significant? Look at verse 19. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Why is the fullness of God directly interlinked with love? Is the fullness of God to love, is the question. Paul says here, he asks you to be empowered in your spirit, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all of the saints. Remember this thing of loving the saints is also that prayer that he said in Ephesians 1 that we had addressed before. Verse 15, for this reason, because of your, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. There is a beautiful thing about having faith in the Lord and having that faith present itself in the love that you have for each other. Christians, not to say that we shouldn't love the individuals in the world as well, that's addressed, right? So Galatians 6, Paul says that, um, um, and always uh, try to um, help one another, especially those of the household of faith. There's, there's, there's a place for those who are not necessarily um, Christians. But the way in which the commandment stands in John 13, actually, let's go to it quickly. Let's go to the commandment very, very, very quickly. Sorry for that, very much. Please. John chapter 13, verse 31. This is the Lord who was speaking to his disciples. Um, how do you know we're speaking to his disciples? Because look at verse 21. They were having dinner. That's when he announces to all the disciples that one of you will betray me. So we know he's chatting to his disciples, right? So look at verse 31. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, right? So his disciples. Yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Here's what's important. Now he's talking to his disciples. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Okay? So Paul then further reiterates that love with each other when he says to understand with all of the saints. There is an understanding of love. Love has a point at which you understand. How is that understanding of love? There's an understanding of love, just for the family, and then one of the brothers comes and knocks on the doors, Are I'm hungry. Now we have to share amongst him. There is an understanding that this thing that I'm doing, I'm sacrificing of myself 
for somebody else, but I'm doing it in love because I understand love. My actions are reciprocating love. I'm taking out my time to come to church to serve because I understand love. I'm taking out of my finances to, to, to contribute to the work of the ministry because I understand. I'm taking off this. I'm beginning to sacrifice. I'm beginning to act. I'm making friends with people who naturally I would not have known or cared to make friends with because these are my brothers and sisters in Christ. How can I not know them? This is the understanding of love. These various examples. But as you begin to engage with the Lord about love, we as a ministry, we as a people should be loving one another to the point at which when people look at us from a distance, it's like there's something, there's an understanding there that we don't get. And it is a deep understanding. It's got length. It's got breadth. It's got height. That's what we know. Now it's got depth. Four dimensions. We are accustomed to 3D. What are these? 4D. Four dimensions. A powerful, elaborate, deep understanding of love. And this he notes as the love of Christ. But this is very important. He says this love not only surpasses all knowledge. So knowing this thing surpasses all knowledge. But he says that what this thing does is it gives you all the fullness of God. What is the greatest of the commandments? That you shall love one another as I've loved you. For all the commandments are filled with this one thing. Right? Okay. Last scripture that we can finish. First Corinthians 13. Dibs, you're checking if I'm quoting these scriptures right. I'm quoting them from memory. You will call me out if I make a mistake. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Paul is saying, as Christians living on the earth right now, we have never seen the face of Jesus. I have never seen the face of Jesus. You've never seen the face of Jesus, but a time is coming when you see the face of Jesus. As Christians now living on this world with evil people in charge, we've never seen true authority. We have never seen the authority of the Lord moving across the face of the earth powerfully and mightily. We haven't seen that, but we're going to see that. We have never seen the true power of the Lord. There is going to be a day where the veil is lifted and we see everything for all that it is. And there will no longer be a prophet who needs to come tell us what is to come because it would have arrived. There will no longer be a need for a heavenly language because we would have been in heaven. And what will remain is love. There will no longer be a need to hope in heaven because it would have arrived. Our inheritance will be before us and we will be left with love. The verses in which Paul is highlighting here, the point at which we're making today, chapter 3, verse 14 to, 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 to 19, I think he's highlighting the significance of this love. I think he's highlighting, number one, the fact that this is all the work of God. That we need the Lord to come in to strengthen us. That it is not something that we ourselves can do. So it would be ridiculous for us to think that we can go on doing this without the help of God. I think he's highlighting to us that we must understand this. That even our Christianity itself, us coming to confess Jesus Christ is a work of the Lord. 
I think he's also secondly highlighting the significance of love. Love for each other in the church and love in general. That this love is the love of Christ. That this love is the fullness of God. And then he ends off this, these, these verses with a, a doxology. He says, Now to him who is able to do far abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. It is important to understand that the glory is the Lord's. It is the Lord's Christianity. It is the Lord's church. It belongs to him. We are members of this powerful work that God is doing. There's a mystery. The Lord has revealed the mystery. And this mystery is going to shine. He's got a stage there. There's a mystery. And boom, the stage lights go on. And the hands and the feet of all the actors are the church. And he's going to use the church to display all of these great and glorious things for his own glory. If you find yourself blessed today, from any point in time from when you were a Christian, or even alive, and you have the audacity to look to yourself, let us pray and ask for the Lord for help, that we may remember Him. Because let's be honest, as people, as Christians, we are sinners, there are times when you forget, you're like, oh, I'm feeling a promotion, because I came this Sunday, and I was doing all these different things. Remember the Lord. And then your tough times, ah, oh, there's this, this burden that I cannot bear. What am I going to do? Remember the Lord. And when he, re- when he releases you from that burden, ah, yes, I'm finally released, I can go relax. Remember the Lord. And let us look to the Lord. Christianity is not something that we should hear about. It's something we should experience. Amen. And same thing as the love of the Lord. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for your grace, your goodness, and your love. We ask, Father, Lord, in heaven, that we may be intentional. That we may be intentional and serious about our relationship with you, Father. That we may know, Lord in heaven, Father, that our task is to love each other. Yes. That we must love one another, Lord. That we must be considerate of each other. Yes. That we must enjoy one another. We must help one another. Yes. Father, you said to us, if any of you is caught in any sins, let those of you who are spiritual help them. Yes. That we shouldn't leave each other broken in the corner, accusing one another of being unholy and unfaithful, but helping and guiding each other. That, Father in heaven, we may display this love, Father, because we were made for good works. By you, you are the one who decided who we are and what we were made for. And you made us for good works, Lord. And these good works, Father, are displayed in love. And I thank you, Father, for your grace. I thank you, Father, for your kindness towards us. I thank you, Father, for being with us. I pray, Father, that you may please forgive us of our boastfulness and our arrogance. Forgive me for my arrogance, for the times in which I was so tempted to look and say, Jo, I got one. For the times I was so tempted, Lord and Heavenly Father, to look to myself and say, I'm going to fail. There's nothing I can do. Who can I call upon? For the times I saw a problem and I ran to try to fix it. Father, please, Lord in Heaven, forgive all of us for our sins, Father, for not running towards you first, Lord in Heaven. You say to us, Father in Heaven, that we can enter the throne room of grace with confidence. Oh, Father, ask Lord in Heaven that we may just be shameless in coming towards you, Father. Shameless to run towards you, Father. Confident, help me, please. I'm in trouble, Lord. Confidently, save me, Lord. Confidently, thank you, Lord. I appreciate what you've done for me in my life. Testifying to you, to our brothers and sisters, telling them of your goodness towards us. We thank you, Lord in heaven, for the great love in which you loved us, that while we were still sinners, Lord in heaven, you came and you called us and you woke us up, Lord in heaven, and now we have this great hope. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.